focus is on worshiping God. So we're studying through this very practical book of James, and we're here in the last part of chapter 4. And you know that uh, several weeks ago, there was, uh, I think, uh, the 19th anniversary of uh, what happened on September the 11th. And you know that morning that many thousands of people got up just like a regular day and uh, they went to work and many of those thousand didn't go home that day. It, it really changed the world, it changed our nation. And James says life is a vapor, life is a mist. And that, that's illustrated by that day and it's illustrated every day that we live. We really don't know what each day will, will bring. Uh, to us. Just like a morning mist is there and then soon vanishes away, life is like that. Life is short. Life is uncertain. There are no guarantees for tomorrow, uh, let alone next year or the next five years or next ten years. Um, You may be young and healthy this morning. You may be old and healthy this morning, but uh, it could be uh, by sundown tonight that things might might change and you might be thinking well that's morbid I don't want to think about those things and I understand that we don't really want to think about those things Uh, but if we ignore these things then we won't live our lives properly in light of eternity and so James says here because life here's the main point it's pretty simple just by hearing the reading from Stephen it stands out because life is a vapor we should humble ourselves before God. We should take each day and humble ourselves before God and to obey His will. He, he's beginning a new section here in this letter, but there's still a connection between this section and what's gone before and what will come after, and it's the idea of humility. We looked at last week verses 1 through 12 of chapter 4 and how that James says that we need to have humility in the conflicts that we have in life, we need to have humility, humble ourselves before God. Now he turns to the idea of humility in regard to the future and, and each day. Uh, he's confronting an arrogant spirit. And I don't think there's anybody in this room that would not struggle with such a thing as James is telling us. This arrogance. These people, profess, his readers, profess to know Christ Yet James says you're living with a worldly attitude and you're not realizing that you're not going to be here forever. John calls this in 1 John chapter 2. You remember when John says, stop loving the world, don't love the world. And he calls this the boastful pride of life. And it's easy to have that, especially easy when we live in a nation where we're so blessed, where we have so many blessings, material blessings especially easy to have this boastful pride of life. And so here they are making plans without taking into account that life is a vapor and also without taking into account God's sovereignty. God's in control of everything. You remember the parable that Jesus told about the prosperous uh, farmer uh, and he said that he uh, things are going well, so I'll build bigger barns to store my goods. I'll say to my soul, soul, take it easy, take your rest. You have many goods for many years. You're, you're set up for, for many years. Take your ease, eat, uh, eat, drink, and be merry. But God said to him, you fool. See, it's, it, to, to have that attitude is a foolish attitude. You fool. This very night, your soul is required of you. And now, who will own the things that you have prepared? That's in Luke chapter 12. So, James makes a couple of points here, and we're going to just work through this. What's uh, especially interesting and uh, surprising to me is that last verse, and we'll talk about that. We've heard that verse, if you know to do good and you don't do it, then it is sin. And we've heard that verse used, and we've heard that verse, and we haven't probably heard the verses that surround it here or go before it. And what's interesting is how does that verse fit into what he's just been saying? And so we're going to explore that. But he says a couple of things. He says life is a vapor, life is a mist. And that means a couple of things. And what, what does that mean? Well, it means life is frail. Life is frail. 
come you who say today or tomorrow you might they may have a mouth that they stretched out on the wall today or tomorrow we'll go to such and such a city and we will spend a year there and we'll engage in business and we'll make a profit James says yet you do not know what your life will be like tomorrow or the text may have the ideas you do not know what will happen tomorrow you don't even know what will happen 10 minutes from now you don't know what's going to happen tomorrow you don't know what's going to happen next year um, people are viewing what we're in the middle of in the world right now in different ways and I'm not getting into any of that but I can tell you this last year I'm sure there was nobody that said we're gonna have what was going on now in the world I'm sure nobody thought that you don't know what your life will be like to, uh, tomorrow I mean these are businessmen and they're arrogantly assuming that they're going to wake up tomorrow and they're going to go to such and such a city and they're going to engage in business and they're going to make a profit from that they even make a profit and nobody's going to rob them of what they have that they're assuming a lot of things here and presuming to know about an unknown future that they don't have the control of that future God has the control of of that future and so as I said the most healthy person in, in this room among us could easily be dead by nightfall and and I know we know that and I, and again that's you know it's just some say well that's more but we don't, we don't want to think about that what well, it's depressing we don't need to obsess about those things because you can't live life now but we do need to see what James is saying when he says you don't even know about tomorrow because your life is a vapor if you never think about those things then you won't make the proper decisions right now in in, in this life you'll proudly make plans and go about life just as if you're going to be forever healthy and forever young and and things are going to be alright James says in verse 16 all such boasting is evil so the idea that life is a vapor means that it's it's frail another thing that it means is that it's short a vapor is short-lived and you see the mist at, at one moment and then a few minutes later it's it's gone you see the steam that comes out of your coffee cup in the morning and it's just it disappears life is like that in Psalm chapter 90 if you have your Bibles and you want to go back there to Psalm chapter 90. Moses, this is one of the uh, few Psalms that's authored by Moses. It's a prayer of Moses. So this is a very ancient Psalm. And in this Psalm, Moses laments how brief life is. And he compares life to the grass of the field that comes up in the morning and then by evening, look at verse 10, he says, uh, it's, it passes away. Well, in verse 10 he says, As for our days may come to 70 years or 80, if our strength endures, yet the best of them are but trouble and sorrow, for they quickly pass and we fly away. Even if you live to be 100, and, and with medical technology and, and, uh, and, and the things we have in this life, there are a lot of people that live to be uh, older. Even if you live to be a hundred, how quickly life flies by. That's what Moses says. Then look at verse 12. <clears throat> That's why he prays, teach us to number our days that we may gain a heart of wisdom. Only God can give us that heart of wisdom and we get that by numbering our days by realizing that that life is is brief and that each day counts each day is is valuable life is frail <clears throat> life is short and then from the idea as you go back to James 4 about life as a vapor it's telling us that death is certain <clears throat> somebody uh, or I read this George Bernard Shaw quote the statistics on death are quite impressive 
one out of one people die. That's going to happen. Death is, is certain. Either we're going to be alive when Jesus comes again or we're going to die. Now, you would think that since death is, is, is certain, it, it's not just probable, it's absolutely certain, unless we're alive when Jesus comes again, that each person would realize that this life is to be lived for God, that we're going to stand before God, we're going to have to answer for how we've, we've lived this life since death is certain, and it's all around us. But strangely, people put it out of mind and go about life as if they'll live forever. Jesus taught us how we are to respond to even disasters in this life. They came to Jesus one time. This is in Luke chapter 13. I'm not going to read the verses 2 through 5, but they came to Jesus one time, and they said, uh, what do you think about this disaster? And it was a disaster that a tower had fallen on some people in Galilee. And Jesus says, do you suppose that these Galileans were greater sinners than all other Galileans because they suffered this fate? It's like if an airplane goes down, do you suppose that everybody on that airplane was greater, were greater sinners than everybody else? And Jesus says, no. I, I tell you no, but unless you repent, you will, you will all likewise perish. <clears throat> and then that tower that fell in Salome, he says, I tell you again, they're not greater sinners, they just were in the wrong place at the wrong time, but unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. What he's saying is you need to learn something from this, and you need to learn how to live your life in trust of, of, of God. When you hear about disasters, whether they're caused by humans, of airplanes flying into buildings, or maybe they're called by, caused by natural causes, by floods, hurricanes, tornadoes, Jesus is saying, make sure you're living a life of repentance. The rabbi said, you repent one day before your death. Let's think about that for a second. You repent one day before your death. And the students ask the rabbi, how do I know when I'm going to die? And the rabbi said, that's the point. You live in repentance before, before God. So not to be ready for something that's 100% certain is, is foolish. And so James says life is a vapor. Also in this text, he says God is in control. God is sovereign. Now, if God is sovereign, that means we're not sovereign. We're not in control. The problem, again, these businessmen are making these plans for the future, um, and they weren't taking God into account. The problem's not that they're making plans for the future. It's not a problem that they're looking to make a profit. The problem is they weren't taking God into account in this. Planning is commended in Scripture. You go through Proverbs. Financial planning is good stewardship if we depend on God and we have the right priorities. It's wise to have a will. It, it's, it's wise to, to have some savings. It, it's wise to have life insurance. But again, all of that is not going to... I mean, there's really no financial security. It's putting our trust in God. So the Bible commends hard work, it commends saving, it commends planning and being smart about these things, but the problem is they're not recognizing God is sovereign. When we recognize that, we'll bow before Him. They're arrogantly making these plans. Their trust was not in God, their trust is in their business ventures and in all the money that, that they would make. So look at what James says in verse 15, instead, what should they have done? Instead, do this. Instead, you ought to say, if it is the Lord's will, if it is the Lord's will, we will live. So it's even determining whether we're going to live. We will live and do this or that. But it's dependent on the Lord's will. Now, James is not giving us something that we can just tack on to the end of a sentence. And it can become that, though you don't hear it much today. Um, 
I remember uh, when I was when I was young, I'd hear a lot of older folks in the church, and they'd say, "If the Lord wills, we'll do this," and "The Lord willing, we'll we'll do this." And it doesn't seem like we hear that mu- that as much as I did then. But but again, you can say the words and not mean the words, and I'm not implying that they were doing that. But James is not saying we just tack this on to the end of our sentences. Uh, Paul says many times, if the Lord wills, I'm not going to go and read all these. Acts 18, 21, 1 Corinthians 4, 19. But sometimes Paul didn't, re- didn't say those words. But he always depended on the Lord and depended on his, his sovereignty. So it's a mindset <clears throat> that's we're to have. If the Lord wills, then we will do this. Sometimes we should say it, I think. But even if we don't say it, we're to think it. That's, that's to control our attitude. One of the most basic lessons in life to learn <clears throat> is God is God, I'm not God. God is God, I'm not God. He's sovereign, he's in control. I'm not in control. And that, uh, again, if we trust him, that takes away a lot of stress, a lot of worry from our lives. Remember in the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus is speaking to those people, and he said, don't worry about what you'll eat, what you'll drink, what you'll wear. And he's not talking to to people who are worried about whether they're out of fashion. He's talking to to people whether they're worried whether they're going to have any kind of clothes. If the locusts come in and just destroy the crops, there's not going to be any food. There could not be water. There's all these things, and they're worried about those things. And Jesus says in the Sermon on the Mount, don't be anxious. Don't be pulled in different directions for this. You trust in the Lord. The Lord knows what you need, and he'll take care of you. He takes care of the birds. He'll take care of you. So we trust in him. Again, this doesn't cancel out the idea of planning and having life insurance and a bank account. I mean, Jesus says, don't lay up for yourself treasures here on earth. You could take that literally, couldn't you? And you could say, well, I'm not going to have a bank account because that's laying up treasure here on earth. He's not saying that. He's saying that's not your main focus. Your main focus is God. You're laying up treasure in, in heaven. Now, we acknowledge God. That's what he's saying here. James says, instead, you ought to say, if the Lord wills, we will live and do this or that. So life is a vapor. God is sovereign over every aspect of life. Notice here it's business people too, so that applies to our work, our business, all of that. You can't separate life and say, okay, this is the church part, this is the business part. All of life is under his control. The third thing that stands out here, a simple little lesson I think from James, is that pride is a great sin. So, the life is a vapor, God is sovereign, but pride and pride is a great sin. Not to take into account God is to live in pride. He says, you don't mention God, and then in verse 13, you boast in your arrogance, and all such boasting is evil. It's these people boasting, and they're, it's like they're full of hot air. In, in one reference I read, this word is used of somebody who's running around said that he knew Alexander the Great. And he didn't even, he had never even seen Alexander the Great. But he's boasting, I, I had a meal with Alexander the Great. James says, all such boasting is evil. This is the pride of life that we talked about from 1 John chapter 2, verse 15. Remember in the Old Testament, the powerful Babylonian king, Nebuchadnezzar, and he's walking on top of his palace, and he says, is this not Babylon that I built? And he's talking about all the power that he has. And while the words are still in his mouth, God acted. God brought him low. And he was eating grass like an animal. And he came to the conclusion that the most high rules in the affairs of humans. God's able to do that. And there are all kind of illustrations. The Pharaoh in Egypt, he's able to do that, and he will do that. It's almost like um, a Christian can fall into practical atheism. We believe in God, yes. We know that he's around, but I've decided I'm going to do this anyway. And I know I'm strong enough, and I have enough um, 
education or enough intelligence, and so I can accomplish this. James says that's boasting, and that boasting is, is, is evil. So how do we view life then? If life is a vapor, God is sovereign, and we're prone to this pride. The answer is humble obedience to God. So look at the last verse of the chapter. Let me read it again. If anyone then knows the good they ought to do and doesn't do it, it is sin for them. That, how does that fit into this context? Now, again, I'm, I'm going to uphold the general teaching of that in that uh, sometimes we're guilty of sins of commission, as we call them, and sometimes sins of omission. We, omit, we know what we should do, and we don't do it, and that's sin. And so that, that truth is taught throughout Scripture, but this is a verse that's in a context of other verses. He's been talking about something. So what would he mean then when he says, if, so he's been saying life is a vapor, God is sovereign, we're prone to pride and not take God into account. And then he says, if anyone then knows the good they ought to do and doesn't do it, it is sin for them. What do you think in this context would be the good that we know we ought to do? It's to humble ourselves before God, to take Him into account in every step uh, of life. We do things we shouldn't do, we don't do things that we know that we should do, but this passage and this verse, I think, is teaching, you know now that you need to take God into account in your life and in your daily life. If you don't do that, then it's sin. So, again, there's balance that we have to always keep when we look at Scripture. So, we plan for the future and we, we work as hard as we can, but again, God's in control. If you don't take into account that God is in control and humble yourself before Him, it's sin. And you know that now because we heard that Stephen read this passage to us. If you never ever heard that passage in your entire life, you've heard it now. And now that you've heard it, you're under, you're under that passage. You have, to, you have to respond to that passage. How are you going to respond? Are you going to be like these businessmen here and fill with pride? Are you going to humble yourself before Him? And that's really a life of ministry. It's a life of humility. See, some people view um, church uh, from a consumer mindset. What can I get? And if I don't get what I, what I think I should get, then I'll just go somewhere else. If you're buying groceries at some place and you go in there and they just stop having groceries, what are you going to do? You probably go somewhere else, won't you? Some people view church that way. It's a consumer mindset, not the mindset of ministry that you're here and I'm here to serve, to give to God. It's not what can I get, it's what can I give. And what we are to do is live humbly before God. Life is a vapor, God is sovereign, and pride is a constant battle, and so we are to humble ourselves before Him. Uh, here, I, and I ran across this on the internet, but here's some homework for all of us this week. Take a piece of paper and write down your personal goals for life. What, what do you want to accomplish in life? <clears throat> Be honest with that. And then look at that. Is, is God in those goals? Are, are you like these business people here? And if he's not, then, then you need to get things right with him. Because if you know to do the good and you don't do it, it's sin. Write those down, and that's, that's going to help us as we think about the, why we're here. See, we can live many years here and not really do anything for God. We've just taken up space, really. We've taken up time. We haven't done good. That's a harsh way to put it, but we're here to glorify God. And we're going to sing this song that Larry announced.
theme is number our days that we have a heart of wisdom if you're not a Christian <clears throat> this morning if you're not a child of God uh, that calls for humility you have to humble yourself before God as you repent you confess the name of Jesus because God sent his son to be our savior and we confess his name we confess what he did for us and we die to sin and you can't you can't die to sin and still live for self so you have to die to yourself and die to sin as you say I, I follow him as my savior Christ is my savior and you, you've died to sin and then you're buried in baptism and your sins are washed away and you're raised up to walk in a, in a new life and that new life is to humble yourself before God to put God first in all of life even business and anything is to put God first if you've done that and you're not living the way that you should be living there, this is a wonderful opportunity for you to, uh, to ask for the prayers of your brothers and sisters so it's our prayer if you need to come you'll do that as we stand and sing this song